ThatGreatBusinessShow.com is brought to you by De Facto Shaving Oil, the best anyone can get. Made in Ireland, sold worldwide. Welcome to episode 61 of That Great Business Show, posting on the 12th of November 2021. I'm Conal O'Moran. Busy pod this week, so we'll get down to business ASAP. As we say, in a minute we have a man who runs the country's small but most perfectly formed internet provider. And we'll hear how he took a boat up the lagon to Belfast to his first job interview. We're in peak Christmas ad season and an early stage US tech company with an EMA HQ in Ireland has developed the cleverest piece of kit to chop up those ads and tell you every detail of what people are actually responding to. And that's across all media, including the likes of Insta and TikTok. And if you're an early stage company heading back to the office, well... What office? Our great friends at the Guinness Enterprise Centre are here to pitch their wares to entice you to join them. And as always, we wish to thank our wonderful sponsor, De Facto Shaving Oil. Makers of the world's best shaving oil for supporting us. That support brings you the best business stories and insights every week. And now that we're travelling again, their 25 ml bottle of all-natural shaving oil is your ideal travel companion. Shipping is totally free for orders over €20. Now, regular listeners know that we don't do acronyms on that great business show. Transgressors have to put 20 euro into the charity box every time they use terms like ISP or WFH. I'm expecting to fill the swear box today because my first guest is David Russell, who I first met at an Irish International Business Network, or IIBN, networking event where I learned that his company, Host Ireland, is one of only a small number of internet providers that own and operate their entire network. For reasons that David will explain, they're based only in the Greater Dublin area, and to make listeners outside the pale turn green with envy, they say they can offer businesses a next-day install. Now, we'll discuss internet provision across the country in a minute, but first I was chatting to David, and of course the subject of hiring people came up. They're hiring, but cannot find network engineers for love nor money. That brought us on to how he, David, took a speedboat up the river lagon to get to his first job in time. And then he told me about a charity collector who came to his office and left with a job. David Russell, welcome to That Great Business Show. Thank you very much, Colin. The lagon speedboat explain. That was so. I was running late for a job interview with the Northern Bank. and Your uh, first job ever. First, first job ever, yeah. It's when I was a student in Queens and Belfast. And I thought, how, what's the quickest way to get to this office, which is just beside the lagon? I row, ruins my sport. So I made my way to the boathouse, asked the boatman, would he mind dropping me up to the interview, which he did. We went speeding up the lagon, uh, like something out of Miami Vice, uh, arrived in time, set an interview, and they asked me, did I come far? And how did I make my way here? And I said, well, it's interesting you asked that question because I arrived here in a speedboat and the rest was history and I got the job. Well done you. I still don't believe that they believed you, but it sounds probably, good. Well, I was a bit windswept looking, so I think they probably <laughs> did. I had a lot more hair then and I think I was a bit more windswept looking. I was only 19 years of age at the time or something. I was a student, so uh, I think they knew by looking at me that I certainly didn't come on the bus. And then later, much later, when you had, were now the boss of Host Ireland, you, a man comes to your door looking for a charitable charitable collection. Well, he was he was downstairs actually outside the office, and we're, we're constantly looking for talent in Host Ireland Business Broadband, uh, and we've always recruited talent. We've always looked for that sort of attitude and that, that that raw talent. I mean, we have engineers, which we'll talk about in a minute, but our CTO, who we certainly believe is is the best in in the country and the best in the industry, he started life as a butcher. You better give him a name. Oh, check. Connor, Connor McGee, I do beg your pardon. He'll he'll kill you, and I get back now to the office when he listens to this much later. But um, he started his life as a butcher and his talent was recognised. He had uh, degrees in agricultural sciences and so forth. Kim and us in our, enter- in our apprenticeship scheme and 15 years or maybe slightly less, I might be aging him now, but around 15 years, he's now our CTO of, of you know, the largest wireless network uh, in Dublin. I was careful not to use Ackman there. But um, in terms of the charity seller, yeah, I mean, we, we stumbled across him outside. We were chatting to him. You know, that's a, a horrific job trying to stop people in the street. 
to try and sign up for the various charities. Uh, he did an incredibly good patter. He didn't get us for the charity, but he got a job out of it. Uh, and he came into our sales team. And you are recruiting, because we better get the ad out, ASAP. I almost have 20 euro, you see. I know, I saw that. <laughs> you used ASAP at the beginning of this. Oh, I did as well, deliberately, actually, <laughs> and well spotted. So because you're looking for network engineers, and you told me that you can train a network engineer in a year. So man, woman, or we won't say child, but man or woman, could be a network engineer with you by this time next year. Absolutely. So we... We have always trained our network engineers, even before. So the pandemic has thrown up a lot of challenges around recruitment. We see it in every hospitality venue, every office. The stats are out there. You know, everybody sees what's going on. We were experiencing this drought in network engineering talent prior to the pandemic. And, and a lot of it is driven by the, I was about to say an acronym there, by the foreign direct investment. That's um, in in Dublin, and they're hoovering up a lot of that talent. And we know all they're the hoovering names. up all, all of that talent. talent. Well, you see, we're experiencing the same challenge with sales, with operation roles, but network engineers particularly. And even when you look at you know sort of the tech the tech side of education and what people go to, the software development side there is just bananas. And there's lots of people doing it. There's some really great um, organisations and institutions. Code Institute is an Irish one that that trains uh, coders and coding boot camps. A brilliant company. But there's nobody in networking. So we do it in-house. We have that um, uh, in-house uh, apprenticeship scheme. So we take people in with experience. We take them from some of the colleges. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we find talent ourselves. Um, and we train them up and we make them into the very best network engineers. And, you know, we'd be amiss to think that they're going to stay with us for the rest of their days. So when they do leave us, they've went on to positions in Ryanair, Airbnb, Cisco Meraki and so forth. So... We can train them up. We can make them the very best. You know, they, they, they have a meaningful career with us uh, until it's time that they decide to move on to their next chapter. Well, we better get on to your business in a second. But if mum, dad or whomsoever is listening, what does a network engineer do? What would you normally say? I know you'd kind of take them from everywhere, a butcher, baker, etc. So, and the final question oh, yeah. is how much do they earn at the beginning? So net, a network engineer will effectively run and manage and support our network and support our customers. So we are very customer focused. Our network operation center is Dublin based. So a lot of uh, internet service providers um, are, be, are have a lot of network operation staff outside, off the island, different, you know, different countries that might operate it. We purposely keep ours in Dublin for the customer service. Our customers are Dublin based, our Leinster based, our network services need to be uh, within re reach of them as well. So you will come in, you will train up, you'll understand all about how an uh, internet service provider network operates, what our technologies are, the equipment we use, you will support customers. Sometimes you'll be working on the actual network. So we would divide our network into what we would call the edge, the core and, and customer. Um, you may be working at the edge and you're working in some of the data centers and working with some real technical, uh, in, incredibly interesting technology that's helping to to to, to power in terms of connectivity, most of the top businesses in the city, our, our customer profile ranges from mid-tier, small to medium-sized enterprise, right up to some of the large multinationals. If you take the top 10 tech companies in Ireland who are coming in through foreign direct investment, uh, we have connections in most of them. So you're operating across such a wide breadth. And you're, you're a breadth of customers, you're operating in, in in the, uh, the sense I say, you're also operating with our own network. And then you're supporting customers around some Problems they may have, challenges, but more than likely you're working with them as they provision their network, as they onboard with us, ensuring that uh, their connection is what they require. And our sales team and our network team work very closely together because of what we do and the customer-centric nature of what we do. We always try and make sure that the connection we offer, the connection that the customer gets, is right. And that's achieved by the network engineer understanding what they're doing, understanding the customers, understanding the network, working hand in glove with our sales team to deliver that connection that is right for the end user. And don't forget to tell me how much these people earn from the beginning, a right raw recruit. So a, a, a raw recruit will start with us sort of, you know, low 30s, around the 30 mark and upwards. And and, and, and they'll progress through us um, in terms of their training and their, uh, you know, work, work, working, getting trained up, investment. We like to invest in our people. So we're constantly training, constantly investing um, because it's important to do that. It's important to do that for our company and for our customers. A network engineering career is incredibly meaningful. Once you train up in the basics and you understand the basics of network engineering, particularly in an internet service provider, 
those skills, that knowledge, that acquired knowledge is transferable to multiple. As I said earlier, those who have trained up through our apprenticeship scheme, stayed with us for three or four years and have moved on, have went on to companies like Airbnb and Cisco Meraki to some incredible jobs and are you know continuing to climb the ranks and do incredibly well. So now that you've hired all of Ireland, and yes, you are, at, the, at the moment you're looking for eight, isn't that right? We're, yes, we, we, we okay. have eight open positions across the company, and both they, sales, operations and network engineering. And they will find you if they want to apply uh, on the website. Postar.com forward slash yeah. careers. Okay. Yeah. I often wonder about that uh, forward slash stuff. I just go mooch on a website and when I find it, I find if, it. If you Google it, you'll find it. It's there. It, so it's pretty obvious. Speaking of hostireland.com, what exactly do you do that you are not a rival to either Air, Vodafone or any of those big companies? You do something very niche. Well, it's niche in the, in the sense of the customer um, service that we offer. It's not niche in terms of the end product. So we offer connectivity to business and we do come up against some of the big the, the big names uh, and we come up against them on a daily basis. We also work with them uh, and have a lot of the names that you mentioned as, as partners uh, to us and we would resell services and wholesale services to them. What we do is, so we can offer speeds from 50 meg contended. So what we talk about contended, we talk about it's a shared or it's a license exempt service. So it's what you would get probably at home or what you'd get in a small business. If you're running a credit card terminal and you're spot at your music in your shop, it's absolutely perfect. And we'll go right up to, we can offer up to 10 gig dedicated. So that's 10 gigabits of uh, bandwidth dedicated, Comreg license dedicated. You're the only person using the connection. So it's an incredibly robust connection. And, you know, the likes of that connection will be used for those top tech companies. You know, think about any tech company that operates in Ireland and they're using, you know, services up to that. So we're unique in that. We're also unique in terms of our service delivering what we can do. So we can install your connection next day. In fact, we can install and have done same day. We never let we never like to see a customer go without. So during the pandemic, we became particularly relevant in that respect. So we saw significant uh, growth during the pandemic from customers who were with other service providers who needed to increase their bandwidth, needed additional services, needed a resilient or a backup connection. So you should always have if you're a business and connectivity is important to your day to day, you should always have a backup connection. Um, so people moved us and we installed them. We had a couple of customers even recently. Uh, Two days ago, in fact, we had a customer called us at 10 o'clock in the morning and by three o'clock that afternoon, they were connected to our network. You know you are making people outside of the city absolutely sick, vomiting, because they've been waiting possibly a year, two years or longer. Why are you Dublin only? And we could get on to the rest of the world after that. Talk to me about why Dublin only. So we're Dublin, we started in Dublin. So our history was we were a hosting company, hence the name Host Ireland. It's not exactly a catchy broadband company name, but we started in the hosting business and we were the largest uh, web hosting company. We then took the move towards broadband in 2011. And from then we've grown the business and added customers to our network and grown our network with continuous investment. So we have a policy of continuous investment in our network. We're constantly investing upgrading equipment, adding more base stations and locations. But we operate in Dublin because there's a lot of business still to be got in Dublin. The nature of what we do and how we do it currently suits Dublin. That's not to say we won't break out of the pale. And we can reach, it's not just Dublin, Greater Dublin, it's not just with inside the M50. We can basically do all of Leinster. We can do as far as Balls, as Balbrig. I was going to say Ballsbridge. Of course we can do Ballsbridge. <laughs> we can do as far, the world, it, there is a world outside D4. Uh, we can go as far as Balbriggan. We can go as far as Greystones. And and over over well over west. So our connectivity, our sort of arc of, con- of connectivity, um, is the Leinster region and, and slightly further afield. I love that one. The arc of connectivity. It sounds like something out of a movie, doesn't it? It does. It does. It's, it, it's a very <laughs> so sexy Cork, title for people from Cork listening. Mm-hmm. They'd love to hear from you. People in Galway, Limerick. You said you hinted there that you might just break out. So when. There's no, there's no immediate plans Why? Um, because we still have a lot of business to get in Dublin. That's not to say we won't. There is, there is a market. There's a significant market there, uh, particularly in the business community and what we do. We have seen that the, there's a change in wh- where businesses are operating. It's, you know, Ireland is not just Dublin. It's Cork, it's Galway, it's 
Athlone, it's Waterford and so forth. So, what about Belfast? You haven't gone in, but you haven't gone back home, have you? Haven't gone back home yet. Connectivity is slightly different in Belfast. Um, we haven't got involved in that. It's just not a market that, from a connectivity perspective, I know all about the drinks business in Belfast, but I don't know about the connectivity market. So, so we haven't touched there. We, we have a lot to still do in Dublin and we a lot of customers. It's the chimney stacks. It's where the business is at, particularly for what we offer. However, there is a market outside Dublin. It's a market that we certainly won't ignore long term. There may be plans. We may look at it. But at this stage, we're still focused on growing our presence in Dublin. And you are wireless. You're a, is it a microwave link? Or? Correct. So we're, wire, we're, we're wireless. Uh, does that mean line of sight? Did you have to have line of sight? It does mean line of sight. Which, of course, is difficult in a city. It's difficult in a city, but not for this network we have. So we have the largest wireless network in Dublin. We have base stations and uh, communication towers right across the city, which means that there's nowhere without a re- without or out of reach for us as a business. We can connect everybody up, whether that be through some of our entry-level products, which are contended, which use um, a different frequency, right up to the direct dedicated line, line of sight. So there's nowhere in the city that is out of reach for us. We can get everybody. And that, and that also gives us that unique position and allows us to service businesses with speeds up to 10 gig. The National Broadband Plan, you actually are very, well, I'll use the term, soft on this. You actually were talking to me on the phone and you were kind of almost crying, not about it, but crying for the people trying to implement it. So you have, you have, some, you have the very best in NBI. You have, and, that, and oh, I've done it. I owe you 20 euros. <laughs> I got so far, so far. That was in about 13 minutes. Damn, oh no. Anyway, so in National Brahman Ireland, uh, you have some that you have the very best. And there is inbuilt challenges uh, into what they're trying to achieve. In many respects, it is like the electrification of Ireland. You're trying to lay cable or fibre to every premise. It's going to be a challenge. It's going to be difficult. And the minds and the people behind it you probably couldn't get better. So the reason I'm, I'm supportive of what they're trying to achieve and what they're doing is because of that. It is not an easy task. We would have always said, and I've always said that we believe fixed wireless has a role to play in the rollout of the National Broadband Plan. We still believe that. Um, and we still think that would help expedite um, you know, the rollout. And, and we've seen this. There, there's a, quite a, a significant example within the connectivity um community or the sector, Google had this great plan of rolling fiber out right across the USA. Uh, they started in 2012 and they're still on that mission. And they Are they still doing it? They're still doing it, yeah. And 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 I'm I'm you know if you if you Google it, if you well ironically if you Google it, if you look at a lot of the press around it, some of the challenges were that it, when you think about it in simple terms, digging trenches, laying fiber right across locations, particularly Ireland, which is geographically different Houses are very far apart. You have one farm here and then you have a small group of houses. Well, America, you know, some of the similar issues, they were Except the distances are Well, the distances are absolutely vast. But what Google were doing is that they were looking at urban areas and there's challenges digging fibre. So in 2017, they moved and they purchased a wireless business. Exact same what we do, same technology, same background to what, what it does. And they now use that as part of their rollout plan across the USA. So they now have 11 urban sites uh, you know, some of the biggest cities in America, you know, parts of San Francisco, Chicago, Kansas, and so forth, rolling out with wireless technology and and doing a hybrid solution where fiber and wireless together are part of their solution to connect businesses with one and two gig uh, across the city, or across the US. And what about the lovely, the fantastic Elon Musk and his Starlink? He wants to come at us with a broadband solution from the sky. Yeah, so... All, all of the technologies that exist all have a role to play in the connect in the future of connectivity. When you when you take it back a step and you think about uh, what is happening the world, what is happening in terms of us being connected, and you know it's well it's well uh, said now that the pandemic expedited our lives by ten years. You know how we approach uh, work. Nearly said the three letter working, working from, from home. home. Uh, how, but how, how we approach work, how we approach interacting with one another, businesses and so forth. Connectivity is, is key to all that. And it can't happen without connectivity. So there is, there's a, a vast selection of connectivity options. And Starlink and Elon Musk is one that will suit a particular use case. And that might be rural communities. It might be someone who needs it for 
you know, lo low level use as in they're running uh, it's a residential or it's a small business. When you come to where we operate in that business to business market, there just isn't, it just will not work in the same way. It has a role, it has a part to play, but not for what we do. And our but customers. even, I don't know, he's putting up a couple of thousand uh, little satellites. Yeah, that's going to be interesting. Well, and and others are doing the same, yeah, remember? Yeah, they are, yeah. If the satellites, and I'm kind of being silly about this now, but if the satellites were bigger, could you not at some stage get enough bandwidth to service big business? So there's loads of limitations in technology and, and being able to do that is probably one of the limitations. The other one is is latency. So when you think about the speed, so so we talk about bandwidth and that's a, that's about the size of the connection. Latency is actually the speed of the connection from one point to the next. When you think about the latency of a satellite connection, there is a delay. So, you know, at the minute, some of the satellite options we have, if you're running voice over IP, it's difficult. You can't because that, that latency piece prevents you from being able to do that. And you're going to have the same issue. When you think about it in simple terms, you're sending information from the ground to the satellite and back down in order to complete whatever you need to do. There, there's a delay around that compared to what we do in fixed wireless. So we are sending over the air, but from very short distances. In terms of air and actually fibre, there's less resistance by sending it through the air. So our latency is industry is, is one of the industry best, if not fixed wireless, is used in multiple industries that require very low latency, so finance sectors and so forth. So there will be challenges and limitations as to what that tech technology can do in the short, medium, and even long term. So that's why there is a collection or a selection of connectivity options out there that will all have their part to play in our new connected future. Starlink is one of them. Fixed wireless and fixed are probably the two significant ones. We would absolutely be beating the drum for fixed wireless. It's what we've built our business. We've proven the use case right across uh, Dublin with some of the some of the iconic small to medium sized enterprises, Irish businesses, some of the original customers we have, which we still have, right up to those large multinationals that everybody knows. But you are not going to go, for example, into Leitrim. Probably not Leitrim. There's certainly no plans for Leitrim, as lovely as Leitrim is. <laughs> because we love giving a bit of hope on this program. Please tell the listeners that broadband is coming their way. So broadband is coming their way. There is multiple uh, companies and organisations and some of the big players who have different solutions. You have the guys uh, in National Broadband Ireland who, who, are, who are rolling out their solution. So there's, it's quite an exciting, in many respects, broadband's utility in some respects, and it's, it's boring and, you know, you think broadband, okay, I have it, I need it. But actually when you drill down and you think about it, it's an incredibly exciting place to be right now. We are moving faster and faster to a more connected world, a more connected businesses. We are interacting with each other and with technology uh, and with commerce in, in a very, very different way than we were even two years ago. Broadband and connectivity is at the heart of all that. It cannot happen without it. Therefore, the innovation, the need for it, what's happening around it is incredibly exciting. Your final question, David, yeah. is who would you hire in a heart? I find this very difficult because there's so many interesting people out there, both the Irish people and international people. So I'm, I'm going to cheat a little bit and take a dream team. But at least, uh, unlike a lot of other people who come onto this podcast, you read your email and you actually saw it and have an idea and have a name, I hope. I have. I have three names. Oh, good. So that's what Even I'm better. cheating about. So what we do as a business host Ireland, we're incredibly customer centric. Customers are the most important thing we have and we try to do everything to keep customers and that's why what we do. We also believe in innovation and are constantly trying to innovate on in what we do and how we offer it. It's one of the reasons why we can offer next day installs at about 30 to 40% cheaper than our nearest competitor. Good ad. Thank you. <laughs> so the first of my dream team would probably be Barbara Humpton. So Barbara Humpton is the CEO of Siemens USA. She has taken uh, older business, Siemens around a long time, and she has helped revolutionize that business. She's redirected that business with a focus on AI. She also has an interesting backstory. I mean, I read one, one of the articles about her. Well, I think the first thing is she's a woman in technology and engineering. She was told many years ago, you have to make a choice, be a mother or work. She, she ignored all of that. And Good now she's her. CEO of one of the largest uh, companies in the world. So her her customer focused and innovative approach I think would be part of that dream team. The other one would be Stuart Butterfield who's helped revolutionize communication particularly in, in an office and commercially he's the CEO and one of the co-founders of Slack. 
he's 100% customer focused and customer centric. And he's, he put a tweet out recently asking customers to tell him what's wrong with his product. That, and that's incredibly brave, <laughs> incredibly brave. As a, as, as a CEO of a company, I, I, you know, that's a brave thing to do. So they would be very much on the dream team around the innovation, the customer. And then the other person, almost in a consultancy or chairman role, would be Bob Iger. Because what he did for Disney and how he brought Disney from a company that was probably, I don't want to say on its way out, but it was cer certainly a legacy to where it is now, which is the powerhouse of media in the world. They own most things. We're watching Disney or some subsidiary of Disney every day. So that would be my dream team that I'd add into the company well, if those, I could ever the, afford them. Those three, I'll give them a bell and see whether I can get them to start. Uh, they could start as network engineers. They could start in, in, in a year's time. They might be earning uh, in the low 30s or something. They might <laughs> they'd be delighted to come join us. <laughs> David, David Russell, CEO of Host Ireland. Thank you so much for joining us on that great big business show. Final question. Anybody who wants to find out about you where will they find you best places go to hostireland.com you'll find all about the company our offering our telephone numbers there give us a shout sales at hostireland.com if anybody's having any connectivity issues please give us a shout we, we want to make people's connectivity better David thank you so much for joining us that great business show make one small switch switching from shaving foam to all natural de facto shaving oil will give you the smoothest softest shave ever switching from shaving oil to de facto helps stop 20 million non-recyclable shaving foam cans go to landfills every year switching from shaving oil to de facto will save your skin your pocket and your planet defactoshave.com Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. Backing great women-led businesses on every show. That great business show. We want to hear from you, so please do follow our LinkedIn page and anyone at all can have a chat with us there. We have smashed the 1,000 followers barrier on that LinkedIn page and it's where we're now sourcing many of the great companies we feature on That Great Business Show. And de facto backs your businesses, so please back them by buying the world's best shaving oil, defactoshave.com. And as creator Tom Murphy keeps reminding people, it's a shaving oil, not a beard oil. So it is for everyone that shaves. And that's why he says it's the best anyone can get. Now, you should absolutely love De Facto Shaving Oil because their support for this podcast means that you get the best business insight tips and hacks available. For example, did you know that when you're advertising the call to action, as they say, using the word get, as in get it now, gets a 53% greater purchase rate than using the word shop now. And the word limited, as in limited offer in static ads, increases the purchase rate by 20% rather than using the word now, as in buy now. There you go. Just those two sentences has made it worth your while to listen to this podcast. But wait, there is plenty more, because joining me now is Lisa Haskins, who is Head of Marketing and lots more at the European HQ of a fascinating New York-based company called VidMob. And because it's a US company, they've produced a thing called their Holiday Report, However, on this side of the Atlantic, we know holiday as Christmas. So Lisa is going to tell us how to max your Christmas advertising spend. Oh, welcome to That Great Business Show, Lisa. Hi. Hi, Connell. Thank you for having me. It's great to be here. Well, first of all, why not tell the listeners about VidMob, based I, did I see on Fifth Avenue in New York? Yep. That's and I love it, what you're doing. <laughs> what are you doing with VidMob? What you told me on the phone. I love it. So, so VidMob is, I suppose, it's, it's grown. Um, but essentially, to, just to try try to sum it up, it's an ad tech company that builds ads for mobile, but in a very different and unique way. We're actually leading what's called a movement of intelligent creative. And intelligent creative, for most people who, who don't know in the advertising industry, is a data-led creative. So when you're creating an ad, it's not just a normal ad. It's an ad that's influenced by data that we found. 
Now, our data is very, very, very unique. Um, just to try to sum it up, gone are the days where your chief marketing officer can come in and say, look, I want the colour red in the ad. Now you can actually argue back a little bit and say, well, you know, red's nice, but we're actually seeing a higher purchase rate when we're using the colour blue. And how we're able to do that is we have our own artificial intelligence, which essentially breaks an ad down frame by frame into a huge volume of different elements. So if you imagine... This will be a TV ad. This would, it? yeah, it could be a TV, it could be any ad. It, it can be a static image too. Is it? Okay. Yeah. Because you gave me a lovely example on the toothpaste one. Yeah. <laughs> Talk me through the that. toothpaste ad. So say for instance, I am, I'm a... I'm a CPG brand and I'm selling toothpaste. If I'm a model and I'm smiling and I'm gazing directly into the camera and I'm, I'm showing the product and I'm, you know, brushing my teeth and all the lovely things you typically see in an ad, it will break it down into these different elements. So it will break it down to smile. It will break it down into gaze direction straight ahead. It will break it down to product, logo placement, colors, every single thing that's in that frame, it will break it down. And so by breaking it down, we take these elements, so the gaze direction, the colours, the text and everything else that was in that frame, and we then pair it down with data from your platform API. That can be Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, whatever have you. We're partners with all the leading platforms. Um, So whatever ads manager you have, we can pull that data through. And what happens is we take those elements, we pair them down with that data from your platform API. And so by doing that, then we're able to say, when the model gaze straight ahead, we notice an, an increase in click-through rates or when you use the colour red, we notice a higher increase in purchases, et cetera, et cetera. It's mad. I mean, Crazy. it's so brilliant. You did, you came from LinkedIn, didn't you? Yeah. And when, when, when you saw this, did you say, this is just too good? I, <laughs> from the amount of constant arguments I had, 30 minute conversation, sometimes two hour conversations arguing over what font we should use, what colours we should use for our brands. This was just a godsend to me. I was like, this this has cut out all those long conversations that we used to have in the room and gets us straight to, you know, putting our ads into action, putting the right colours in, all based on informed decision making. And when you break it down, you also break it down into perfect ads for TikTok perfect ads for Instagram, et cetera. Exactly. Because we're, because we're, um, you know, we're partners with all of the platforms, we firstly get first dibs pretty much on all of the best practices that come from the platforms. So obviously for, not obviously for most people, but, um, but for TikTok, for example, it's all about trends. Make sure, you know, certain music is being put into the ads. You know, we can find out things like what length typically your ad should be. And that's what we call best practices. And get on to the holiday report, so-called, because I was not just shocked. I'm just, I'm looking at the length of, or the lack of length of time people are only watching their ads. For example, nine seconds is the optimum time. Nine seconds. Yep. You know, that translates to 27 words. That's the optimum for which which, uh, platform? So we have, so this one was actually for Facebook. And, and one thing I, I want to make sure everybody's aware of is that your, your mind expects different ads when you shift from different platforms. So what I see on Facebook, I won't expect to see the same thing on, on a Snapchat, on a TikTok, et cetera. So we do build certain ads for the different platforms to make sure that you're really, you know, getting the bang for your buck, basically. Um, but for the holiday insights, yeah, we found some pretty interesting stuff when we looked at this this AI, uh, this this recognition data that really only VidMob can can pull at the moment. So, um, some of the pretty incredible insights that we found was, you know, one th- and and I just want to sort of say that these were all like e-commerce brands. So the KPI that we were looking at was specifically purchase rate. So for anybody who's in the e-commerce space and wants to increase their purchases, this is something nice to hear. So that's anybody who's selling online, basically. Exactly. Go ahead. Exactly. So, um, yeah, we looked at 12, 12, over 12,000 ads, over 68 brands, over 3 billion impressions. B- and Billion? I yeah, mean, it's billion. nuts. I know. I know. <laughs> the... Um, and one of the first things that we've seen was that, you know, videos drove a 30% higher purchase rate compared to static ads. Okay, so, so go video. Go video. So that, yeah. that's that's the first one. If, if you're not, if you're just using static right now, go video. The second one then was that f- video, this is the one that you love. So video, video ads with one to five seconds in duration had a purchase rate 167% higher than the overall video average 
and 700%, so seven times the average, um, than videos with 16 seconds or longer. So just, I won't say don't bother, but like a cough will get you bigger, <laughs> will get you bigger sales than somebody yakking on a bit telling you that it's the world's greatest blah, blah, blah. Exactly. We actually, we, we, we have, we have that a lot with clients who come back to us and they say, oh, 15 seconds is, is the plaf- is the best practice from Facebook. It really depends on what KPI you're trying to choose. If you're, if you're trying to get somebody to purchase an ad, tell them you're trying to get them to purchase straight away in the ad because they, they need to know what the product is about, what the benefit of the product is, all in the space of maybe five seconds. Five seconds five is 15 seconds. words if you don't. Three words per second. That's the inside secret of broadcast, FYI. Exactly. So um, have a think about your strategy there. Um, the next one then is to lead with text. And again, we see this typically for video ads that are trying to increase purchase rates specifically. So ignore brand awareness because that's a whole different thing. But for purchase, in order to increase purchase rates, we saw that um, videos with text in the first frame saw a three times saw three times higher sales lift um, than ads that introduced text after the first three seconds. Did that surprise you? I'd be very surprised by that because text to me kind of all is almost to turn off. Yeah, but obviously it's not. I'm completely wrong. Not for the first time. It it doesn't surprise me because I've. I, I came from a data background and I, I just from looking from for brand awareness, if you want people to look at your ad longer, completely agree with you. Usually usually showing a person in the ad and something a bit of music, you know, and a bit of music action, yeah. kind of keeps people watching. But if you want people to purchase, it's a completely different thing. You well, want to have text at the front. Because of course something like James Bond is the perfect idea of how to sell in a way. And he always starts off on action. And yep. then about 10 minutes in, you get dun, 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 <laughs> et cetera. <laughs> yeah, I love that. That's great My metaphor. music is so bad. <laughs> <laughs> but what you're saying is, forget about all of that. Tell them to buy and then give them the backstory in the next four seconds. Exactly. If I can get to the point, like if, if I can sum it up, get to the point. Like tell them, tell the customer what you want them to do. This is the product. I want you to buy it. And you only have about three to five seconds to do that. So make sure you're using text to get that message across to the Mesa. I wonder where it will all end. I'm beginning to sound like an alpha. Where will it all end? Because, <laughs> but I mean, in five seconds, I mean, you know, soon it'll be, Michael, that will, that'll be, that'll be the ads. That'll be yeah. it. <laughs> I, there, there are people like, there are ads that I've seen who, there, there's a there's a formula, right? And it's called a benefit, your reason to believe, and then your call to action. Your benefit is what your product um, benefit. So for example, you have the de facto oil. What exactly does that do? It's a hun- Well, the benefit is it's 100% natural. Uh, I'm just using that now from reading the box, but there could be other benefits. You it gives you the best, smoothest shave ever. There you go. <laughs> the best, smoothest shave ever. That's your benefit. Then your reason to believe is your, um, you know, it could be a testimonial or it could be a before and after of the person's smooth skin. And then your call to action then is obviously buy now and, and where they should go to buy it. So you have to try to sum all this up into a sh- such a short space of time, but that's typically the formula for purchase rates for e-commerce. And does it have to be repeated, 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 repeated? Because is that the other side of it? Is you might get away with a really short ad, but then it has to be repeated forever. Because of course, you know, on social media, things just move and move and move. So we have we have a thing, um, particularly in in your Facebook ads manager, and you'll see that your ads start to decay over a certain period of time. So it's not that you have to keep you know sharing the same message, but you have to try to compete with. For example, if, if for example again you're you're sharing this de facto shaving oil, you'll probably have about I don't know thousands of brands that are also selling shaving oil going for them same customers who are right now trying to buy shaving oil so if you keep giving them the same ad they're programmed now to know it's an ad because they've seen it so many times so while your performance is increasing and it's doing quite well make sure you start to have another ad prepared so that when that decay starts to happen you can quickly put that up so you're retargeting the same audience but now it's with the same product but it's with new messaging and and it gets them back in again Um, and we see that happen time and time again it's a bit different to TV where it's awareness and it's you know pushing it in front of you all the time e-commerce is kind of like a whole different animal um, and especially social in general that you have to kind of keep an eye on that decay graph and have different types of um, creative ready to kind of start to churn out when you start to see that decay happening. Any further insights from your holiday report? Um, because we have to get on to Video Mob because your boss in Fifth Avenue, New York is going to be listening to this. And unless <laughs> you tell the world about Video video Mob, he's going to, or Vid, vid Mob, sorry, vid mob, yeah. vid mob, he'll go mental. Is it aimed at smaller companies or are you actually targeting the really big fellas? So we're both. 
So what's what's great about VidMob is that we actually have an impression-based model. So it means that really depending on how much you're spending on social, we can match that in terms of our price. So if you're a big, hello, massive... Hello is low. Hello is low. God, now like, you have We're, we're talking about Irish SMEs here. They're not going to spend money because they haven't got it. I, I, I suppose like low is low. I mean, we lead with the data-led creative. So we essentially won't take a client on unless they have enough in their ads manager to pull in enough data to be able to inform their ads. So we try to make sure that there's, and I'm making this number up, but it could be like a case of, um, you want to make sure there's about 30 different campaigns that you've launched in the space of a year. That's typically what we go by. So if you if you have about 30 campaigns that you've launched, there should be enough data in there to be able to, and it doesn't have to be paid by the way, it can be organic data. Um, so it can just, it can be that small SME who hasn't really, who's just went on word of mouth. Yeah. We can actually pull their data in, but we need to have material having gone out for a there while. There are great people, particularly on the makeup area, you know, the Amy Connollys and the Joe Browns and all that we've had on the program. And they just constantly, they never stop. Yeah. 24 hours a day. If there was a fifth, 25th hour, they'd be doing it as well. Yeah. And they probably would be ideal for you. Is it expensive? It's not expensive. It, it, it depends on what you... <laughs> she said, uh, not having to spend it. What? I mean, I, I think when, when you see the when you see what you get in return, like you get, you don't just get, for example, data-led creative being built for you, if you want it. You also get a platform. So you're getting your data in real time. Like a perfect example is there's a lot of enterprise companies out there that are waiting six weeks to get data back. And it's not even, it's 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 gone past the time they can use it. You're getting this data in real time to a point you can keep qu- quickly tweak your ads. You have a community there to make the ads for you when you don't have bandwidth. And then you also have this, um, it's it's like, it's 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 like a section of the platform, a creative section where you can leave time stamped feedback in order to keep communication as tight as possible. So I'm, you're you've lost quickly. me. You've lost me now. I got the piece about okay. the. Uh, <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> no, but that final piece. I mean, I understand okay. that if if you're only getting data six weeks later, uh, mm-hmm. and it's coming up to Christmas, your Christmas you'd be into exactly. Easter before uh, you you know what's co- happened in, in Christmas. So that's not good to you. Yeah. Your stuff gives it instantly, does it? It does. It gives it, it's, it's real-time data. So literally oh, as soon as you put an ad out, you're seeing it. And you're seeing um, typically, uh, like it, it, it's also the fact that like, look, you can make an ad and it can underperform. Typically when people make an ad with VidMob, it performs by 2x. So if you are a person who's trying to increase your purchases, the fact that you on average can see your purchases increase by 2x because the creative is high in quality, that's something that, you know, I mean, you can't put a price on because you're really starting to increase yeah. your revenue with your ads. So uh, the cost, let's get down to the nuts and bolts, just round figures. Are we talking okay. about thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands? Again, it really depends on the... At the very, 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 very bottom. At the very, very, very bottom, um, we can typically do a, a hero concept. So that's like taking your, I don't know, TVC and churning it up into so something. What? It's like taking your TV ad and turning it into something yeah. more suitable for mobile. What did you we say? Call TVC? A, a, a TVC, yeah. We call that like a, a, a TV. That's what we call it. TV, TV ad. Okay. <laughs> I know. Every day uh, is <laughs> a school day. It's probably the American lingo coming into my brain and nobody in Ireland knows what I'm talking about because I've listened to them so long. Um, so anyway, you take your TV ad. You take your TV ad and it really depends on where you are. So it's it's kind of hard to put a price on it because it'd be a different price for a creator in Ireland where you might have, I'll give you an example, you might have a creator in Ireland who will do the ad for you for 5,000 euro. But then you're saying, well, I'm not from Ireland, I'm from Russia and I want to build an ad, you know, or if even if you're from Ireland, I want to build an ad for Russia, for my company, because that's where we're getting a lot of our spend. That's going to be cheaper because we have a creator over there who will obviously be looking for a cheaper price based on where they're from. And so we tend to change the price that's suitable to that market that they're aiming for. And again, the impressions that they're, they're the number of impressions that they're bringing in. For example, if you're a small client who only has 30,000 impressions, we're not going to charge you the same amount as an, a large enterprise client who's bringing in billions of impressions, you know? Okay, that was kind of an answer. It was, I know. <laughs> you're I very like, good. I'm not the salesperson. <laughs> <laughs> but if they want to talk to you, they can talk to Lisa Haskins. Absolutely. Lisa, before I let you go, you know yeah. what, what I'm going to ask you. Hire in a heartbeat. Who would you hire in a heartbeat? Oh, if, if I was to hire somebody, I guess it would be, it's actually a client of hers. So she'll laugh. Her name is um, Mariana Leal Mayer. I hope I didn't butcher her name, but she's a client who works at Delivery Hero. And she's just been an absolute pleasure to work with. She's like the dream 
the dream person to work with, but then I could imagine her being the dream hire. She's organized. She's a performance marketer. And from my personal work, I think that she'd just be amazing. She's, and is she's Mariana based in Dublin or where? She's not actually. She's based in Germany. That's okay. That's allowed. We can move her over. <laughs> <laughs> She'll accept. <laughs> but you probably work virtually anyway. Yeah, that is fantastic. Yeah. So anybody who wants to contact you, you guys are based down by the canal. Am I right? In we are, which we are, canal? We're, we're based by the um, the Grand Canal, so Johnson's Key, right next to, to Facebook and a few other platforms. Um, and one thing I will say is that we're hiring at the moment. We're hiring client partners. We're hiring What's people a client from partner? my. It'd be essentially a client partner, would be like an account manager, like typically like a, a seller. Yeah. Um, and then for me, you know, marketing, we're looking for field marketers at the moment. We're looking for engineers. We're, we're hiring. We're, we're also looking for small t- um, people to suit our um, business development reps and, and small to medium business teams. So there's a lot going on with the company at the moment. We're growing in Ireland. Everybody is hiring, as you know. And the previous interview was with a guy called David Russell of Host Ireland. And you know who he hired? There was a, fellow, there was a charity <laughs> collector outside his, uh, his office and he had a chat with him and he was hired. And he's now network engineer, as far as I know. There you go. Go, outside, go outside your office. <laughs> yeah, just stand outside. <laughs> Does anybody want a I, job? <laughs> I honestly believe it's getting very, very close to that. Lisa, Lisa Haskins of Vidmob, thank you so much for joining us on That Great Business Show. It's all go at Corsi Gno on thatgreatbusinessshow.com. Thinking of travel? If so, make sure to make de facto the world's best shaving oil your choice of travel companion. A 25 milliliter bottle of de facto means no hassle at airports, no bulky cans to carry, and the guarantee of the world's best shave. DeFactoShave.com. Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRedCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRedCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. Kenobio, at that great business show. All of us in business know that the two big challenges at the moment is to find staff and secondly, to find out whether, depending on your sector, whether your staff will be working in an office, remotely or in hybrid form. One of the options for those who are unsure of their future location and who may have given up their former office space is to try to get into one of those incubators that are now dotted right around the country. One of the earliest incubators was the Guinness Enterprise Centre that is HQ'd right next door to the world-famous brewery in downtown Dublin. They've just announced a further expansion, but if you fancy setting up shop there, you better be quick, as Guinness Enterprise Centre CEO and a massive Team GBF supporter, Eamon Sayers, says he will have a full house by early next year. I'll also chat to one lucky company already ensconced in the centre. But first, Eamon Sayers, welcome to That Great Business Show. Yeah, Thank you, Connell. Good to see you. And thank you for your support of Team GBS over the years. Yes. You're expanding. You are going to have 100,000 square feet. That is massive by any, any, any measure. Yeah, no, it is. It's a, it's a big ship. Um, it's become, it's been, and potentially... Um, well, it's the biggest ship in the country by significant. We already were the single b- biggest uh, building uh, supporting startups uh, in the country. Uh, so we've now doubled capacity um, with the intention of you know creating a global entrepreneurial super hub, interconnecting government with with community, with business, and with academia. You heard it here first: an entrepreneurial super hub. Yes, I haven't come across one of those before, but that is really good news. How many companies have you got down there or will you have? Because there's a little bit of uh, work still to be done, isn't there? Yeah, so maybe just pre-build, you know, so the build was, we, we announced the build in February 2019. And at the time... We good would, timing. Yeah, yeah. At the time we... <laughs> what, what happened after that? Mm. Well, it was a year later. <laughs> oh, was it? Sorry. Yes. Okay. Yeah, sorry. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Who knows? I know. It, fe- it feels that length of time. Um, so at the time we would ha- we were full and we'd been full for a good four or five years with 90 resident startups employing about 450 on site and an additional 130 co-working companies. And even within that, we had a 30% churn rate. So the idea was the company came in, we helped them grow and scale and we couldn't add value anymore. They left. Uh, that, that, they pushed or did they leave? Well, <laughs> well at the time, we had only five rooms that could accommodate companies with more than 10, 12 people. 
Um, so by so, their very essence, as they started to scale, they had to leave anyway. Um, but no, so we embarked it on a on a major ambitious project. Little did we know that we ended up having to fight a pandemic with the ambition. Um, but we're delighted to say throughout the whole thing, we stayed open uh, to our clients. And I would say 15 to 20 of our clients were there on a daily basis because they're working with the emergency services or in the healthcare, etc. Um, and we really properly reopened in, as in more fully reopened back in May this year when the build was complete. Uh, and we were delighted to have Antonishta uh, around yesterday to help us officially launched the GC and he got to meet uh, a lot of our top class clients, one of whom you're going to meet later. And amongst those clients, what what's the kind of sectoral mix? Is it absolutely everything baker, candlestick maker? Though is it primarily tech? Yeah, we don't have any bakers or candlestick makers uh, <laughs> nowadays. Um, but interestingly enough, one of our co-founder, one of our co-founding groups uh, were very much in that space, but primarily tech. Absolutely. About 75% of our clients are, are tech focused. And what are the other 25? Uh, so we, we would have the bones of maybe 27 different industries. So we have some people in the fashion design space, in the entertainment space, we even have one jeweler there. Our, our thought process is, can we get as many industries there? Because you just never know, you know, a, a company is talking, you know, one company talks to another, one industry talks to a techie, and all of a sudden they might create something that can change the industry. Um, so it's all about community for us. Um, two years ago, it was all about community. As soon as you walked in the door, you immediately got a sense of how can this place help? Uh, and that was all our focus was how can we help you as an entrepreneur grow and scale your company and sometimes we'd, be, we'd have been bold enough to say we can't help you um, but in, in those cases we'd still make an introduction to somebody we believed who could um, so that's going to be our big challenge actually going forward now is to recreate that community but always within the GC you had people who had been on the journey before you some of whom were in your same industry and the most important thing is we got them talking together. But the good thing about the community you're trying to create there are, they are all entrepreneurs and they do talk to each other and we do support each other as well. Yes, they, they do, but they do. And I suppose it's important that they understand that they, to listen to each other because they've all got questions, uh, but sometimes they don't, they're looking for, they're looking for the, what they believe is the right answer. So for us, it's all about, can we get peer-to-peer -peer knowledge is the best way to, you know, you can have as many lecturers as you want. Uh, in a room, but can you get people who've done the journey before uh, or are currently in the journey might only be a year ahead of you. Uh, so we work on that. So we run on a monthly basis. We'd have a founders meetup where the entrepreneurs would say, this is the challenge I'm having this month. Can any in the room help? Uh, the following week, we'd have a tech meetup for the CTOs invariably meet up. And I've been to a few of those meetings and, and being a non-techie uh, very quickly after the names have been announced, I'm kind of a bit lost, but that's OK. Um, I suppose I should be to, to a large extent in that sense. Uh, and then we've sales and marketing teams meet up. And again, so it's all learning from each other, passing on knowledge, passing on skills and finding the best way, you know, find out who are the best people to talk to and people sharing their resources and be that their, you know, the traditional philofax. Or whatever, whatever the new tech phrase for that is. Or it used to be a Rolodex. Do you remember Rolo that? Uh, no, uh, that, no, the that, no. Side. I know, I still have hair in my head. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, what a... Oh, dirty that dig, I know. hurt. <laughs> that, oh, my God. Oh. You're dead. Yeah, I'll, pay, yeah, I'll pay for that in a later question, I'm sure. Yeah. You must yeah. have, I mean, I know you have a queue of people trying to get in. Mm -hmm. So you, you don't really have to promote it. But where are these companies coming from? Are they coming from Leo's? Are they coming from Dublin only? Or where are they coming from? So, well, primarily they're coming from our own community. Uh, the best people, the best ambassadors we have at the Guinness Enterprise Centre are our current clients and former clients. And that's a great credit to the, the team we have in the They're GC. selling it, but I'm, I'm wondering where are, what locations are they coming from to move into the uh, Enterprise Centre? Yeah, so, okay, I, sorry, mis misunderstood your first I'm going to kill him, I'm still going to kill him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so we have companies, so the GC is managed by Dublin BIC, so companies are coming through Dublin BIC and other BICs. Uh, companies, we have a fantastic relationship with Dublin City Local Enterprise Office. Greg Swift there has done phenomenal work and his team. Uh, so they come through the Leos uh, and also through Enterprise Ireland. We're fortunate to have Owen Ahnren on the board, who's the regional director in Dublin. Uh, Kevin Donnelly, Peter Lennox and a few others in Enterprise Ireland have been fantastic. And, you know, in, you know all they can do is make suggestions. Uh, you know, companies are trying to find what's the best place for themselves. Uh, in the GC, we always believe our first question to anyone walking in the door is how can we help you? Uh, such an open-ended question. Um, but it's, it's our philosophy amongst the team and amongst the community in the GC. It's all about how can we help? Would there be people from Kerry? 
coming up to you. And with a name like Sayers now, there might have been a connect, Kerry connection there. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm a Kerry man. <laughs> very, very proud to say it. Uh, you know, jokingly, I tell people I'm in exile. Um, the are you, are you seeing fellas from coming uh, coming from around the country, Mayo, Kerry, or Cork, or anywhere coming? Yeah, up so to you? we've we've been running a program for more than five years now. So pre-pandemic, before everybody started talking about um, working from rural Ireland, etc. So we started a program about five years ago. We partner with hubs all across the uh, across the island called CoConnect. Um, with a very simple message to say to the hub managers, whether you're in, in Dingle, Cor- Galway or in, in Donegal, that your startups can come when they come to Dublin or I'm going to, rather than going to a hotel lobby or rather than going to a coffee shop, they can base themselves in the GC for the day or two. And similarly, our clients can base themselves sometimes. Some of them have used it. Many of them actually have used it for, when they're on holidays in the last year or two in particular. Uh, but also we have a, a very clear message to the startups across the country is through the GEC, you get access to every single thing a Dublin startup can get access to. But most importantly, we can help you grow and scale from where you're based yourself. I'm going to spend a few seconds now trying to think of how to get you back because first of all, we're going to take a quick break and then we'll be joined by Marianne Checkley of Kinia based at the Guinness Enterprise Centre. Subscribe today to That Great Business Show on your favourite podcast platform, including Apple and Spotify. Viscosity. When you shave, you want the highest viscosity because it helps the blade run smoother. De facto, the world's best shaving oil has incredible viscosity. That's why De facto leaves your face, underarms, or legs nick free. Higher viscosity makes blades last longer. De facto is the best for your skin and your pocket. DeFactoShave.com. Everyday accounting can be a bit of a drama for SMEs. However, BigRentCloud.com takes the drama away with its simple and easy-to-use cloud-based accounting and payroll software designed for SME owners. Raise and send invoices, manage VAT reports and obligations, run management reports, link directly to Irish banks, automatically import purchase invoices, and so much more. All with five-star customer support. BigRentCloud.com, 100% Irish-owned and a proud member of Team GBS. Welcome back, and we're still talking about the expansion of the Guinness Enterprise Centre. One company based there is called Kinia that helps places of learning with the digital equipment, professional development and interventions they need to create the best learning experience possible. Marianne Checkley is CEO of Kinia. Marianne, welcome to That Great Business Show. Thank you, Connell. Delighted to be here. Tell me, tell us all about Kinia. So we are, as you said, making sure that all young people can confidently create their future. And the reason we're doing that is because right now that's not the case. Uh, We know that there are traditional achievement gaps in education and also in progression to further careers. Like, say, we know that the people who end up being doctors, lawyers, uh, politicians in some cases uh, are from certain sectors of society and there isn't an equal spread there. And now with the tech se- sector and the tech industry, that gap is growing and it's accelerating because of the pace of that sector. So we have people in communities all around the country who have no reference points to what's going on in a centre like the GEC. So what do you do? do? Give me just one example. So our team go into schools and into youth centres. They provide them with the kit and the resources. But most importantly, they provide the teachers and youth workers with the skills, knowledge and confidence that they need to be able to make the best learning environment possible and also to, to connect all young people to spark an interest in creativity, in technology and in industry. And what's your measure of success? Do you look to see whether they or do you follow to see whether people have gone in to say the tech sector? So our measure of success is in some ways in the amount of teachers who have and and youth workers who have the skills. So we do pre and post measurement. So we know we have a really good idea right now uh, out there in the market of the amount of teachers and youth workers who have done some kind of professional development in tech, in educational technology. We are, we do follow uh, the journey of young people uh, more on a qualitative basis. So we follow case studies of young people, maybe from uh, a different cohorts and different groups like women, girls in STEM, uh, young travellers, uh, young people from areas and communities around the country who traditionally wouldn't have progression to that career. We follow their journey. 
And importantly for me, and I know importantly for you, you also do it as Gaelge. We do for sure. Yeah, Kinsha. Which means that you can provide your courses as Gaelge for Gael Clashti, Gael Skullina, and Gael Tacht areas. Yeah? Gael Tacht areas, yeah. You know, we look at diversity and inclusion as a very, you know, it's, it's not a narrow remit, it's a broad remit. And that's our connection to technology and industry as well. We want to make that industry richer, uh, more diverse. Uh, we know there's a challenge there in the talent pipeline. We also believe that, look, if if we want the software that you, Eamon and myself, are consuming every day to be developed by a very diverse group of, of people rather than just one single cohort, uh, we need to bring people into that industry. So that means a lot of things. So that means... Uh, language, a richness in language, a, li- a richness in people from rural, urban backgrounds uh, and different cultural contexts as well. So we better get back to Eamon and to the GEC, the Guinness Enterprise Centre. How good, how useful has it been to Kenya? It's incredibly useful to us. Uh, I'd say, first of all, like if I was to sum up the environment of the GEC when you walk in the door, it's just that warm energy from the team uh, and uh, Eamon, you know, in being so supportive. Uh, I think for us as well, like a, a huge benefit is we have a team of about 20. We have a national reach across around the country. So just in even in hearing a little bit about of our work, you would get a sense of how important it is for us to be connected to a hub that is really a, an incubator for the next generation of entrepreneurs that has that energy that has people going around being problem solvers, being motivated and using technology in a new and creative way. So we're talking to people like the guys from Volograms, uh, people who are developing drone technology, med tech. So our team are just absorbing and soaking all of that up and bringing that back into schools and youth centres. So what Eamon said is true, is that you do have the chats. As they say. We all have the chats. Yeah, we have the chats. It's a great space for that. Uh, and I think uh, the environment lends to it. But again, back to that just warmth of energy of the team and of the community, uh, that creates an atmosphere in the GEC where people just do it naturally. Like networking can be seen as a challenge for some people and can be seen as this big thing. But when it's done naturally in an environment that's really conducive to it, uh, I think it just creates the, creates the chats, uh, creates the curiosity most importantly, people are genuinely interested in what's going on. And I think people always feel that no matter who you're having the conversation with, there will always be something to learn. And I think that's key. And if people have not been in an incubator, there is an there's an electricity runs mm-hmm. through them. Just people are trying to do things. People are failing as well, fine. But people are succeeding and just trying something new. Isn't that right? Or completely like it's it's it, it's it's journeys you know and you're hearing about failure is okay and that's a message we bring into young people and communities as well you know try fail it's all learning you know it's all developing resilience but also developing creative solutions uh, to what you've learned from from a mistake or from a failure so uh, it's just hearing the the dynamic stories of people and uh, not just people from Kerry, I think as well. <laughs> it's people, you know, from France, Great from Germany, <laughs> you know, that That's are coming brilliant. from like all over Europe too. Cool. There is, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah so for would sure. it be fair to say if you had a third t- thumb, he almost said a third thumb, mm-hmm. a third thumb, would you give it a three thumbs up? Absolutely, yeah. Eamon, that's not a bad way to switch over to you because I said it earlier that you probably are chock-a-block, really, or anybody. Who should apply? How can they apply? And how quickly should they apply? Yeah, well, we're always there to help, I suppose, and that's the most important thing. How can we help you? You know, call us is probably the first thing. You know, come in, meet us for a coffee. We find out how we can help you. Uh, We introduce you to entrepreneurs like Marianne and others. And we, we learn from them. They learn from us. Uh, so people should apply as often as they can. They should encourage people to come in. Like we're all in this together. What we, what we are doing, uh, Connell, is adding economic wealth to the nation. And I think that, you know, is often forgotten that a small incubator, uh, the value can add to the country. You know, we will be, we'll have 900 people um, there year on year, um, day by day all creating economic wealth for the country. And you know, I hate the word failure because I, 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 a journey is a much better word. <sighs> Listen, business because, fail, because if you use the word failure, then you've got to define the word success. Like, mm. you know, and I've seen people who have had to close down companies but have ended up in great jobs 
because of it. So on their journey, their big success. Mm. So in a moment in time, sometimes you win silver. Uh, you know, we not everybody can win gold. You're still not a failure. In your own eyes, sometimes, unfortunately, when you win silver, you think you are. Um, but no, that's all, all, all we can do in the GC and, and Marianne, I, if we ever have a job in marketing, I think you, you'll... Uh, <laughs> she's just won. De- 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 just won, yeah. Fant- fantastic. Um, no, and she's dead right. It's about community and it's about being able to open those doors. And this was one of the things we do is we'll open and push you through them because there are some shy people. There are some people who are very tech oriented and they're not business oriented. And one of our roles is to try and get them in front of people and start thinking and maybe looking at their business model in a different and better way. My briefing document says that you will be full in quarter one next year. Is that right? Yes. Yes. When, when, I, when we say full, it'll be 90% full. Obviously, we'll stay with our churn rate, uh, Connell. But, okay. you know, in, so in, there's in a really always positive way. a reason to apply. Yeah? Yes. Yes. And is there a perfect applicant? Is there a perfect company, type of company that you're looking for? Is it 70? I mean, you said already it skews 75% tech. Is there anything or any area sector that you'd love to see a bit more of? Well, there, there are two key focuses for us in the next two, three years when we're going forward uh, as part of the government action plan for jobs or, or whatever equivalent that is being announced at the end of this month. Uh, we'll be recognised as Ireland's circular economy hotspot. Um, and that will mean getting our building sustainable, getting the entity, the GC sustainable, but also bringing all our clients along that sustainable journey and helping them become sustainable and then helping hubs all across the country uh, teach them also to become sustainable and which will all help Ireland Inc. in, in the long run. We're also, we'll also be announcing um, post-Christmas uh, a partnership with St. James's Hospital. So we'll be creating the St. James's uh, Hospital Medical Innovation Centre at the GEC. Um, and the, the idea being there is how can we help early stage healthcare companies in Ireland get access to uh, clinical trials and also the people in St. James's who have... Um, has with solutions to healthcare problems, you know, can we help them uh, commercialise those? Uh, that's so that'll great. Be really that's really innovative, in the, isn't in it? In the weeks ahead, yeah. Is that an Eamon Sayers project or who came up with that one? I love that one. Well, it, it's been in the ether for a while. Yeah. Um, and What's if, a while? Uh, a year? Two years? You know, a few five years, years? A few years. Yeah. And, uh, you know, Mary Day and Orla Veal and her team, um, Vincent Callan up there in St. James's uh, have come and we were supposed to really a meeting of minds and Mary's in the role uh, just less than a year we met with her and we both had the same thought process uh, from a vision point of view. And now we're sitting down and making it a reality and we'll be looking for partners in the weeks and months ahead to bring it to reality. And I'm right in saying James is, is the country's largest hospital, isn't that right? Yes, yeah. yes. And obviously the National Children's Hospital right beside it also. Yeah. Oh, well, don't go there. Do yeah. not go there. No, 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 no. Come here to me, both of you. Final question. And I'll ask you, Marianne, first of all, who would you hire in a heartbeat? It's a tough one. I thought, for a second, I said, oh, no, oh, no, I'm sure I told her to make sure that you have a heart and a heartbeat. And you give me a heart. He's, he's upset me already. So, uh, But I have thought about it. Oh, God. Uh, so um, I would say Elizabeth Churchill, who is the user experience, user design experience director of Google. and Great name. Is she anything to do, do you think, to... Winston Churchill, do you think? I don't know, and that's not the reason I'd hire oh, her sorry, either. Okay. Even, if, <laughs> <laughs> uh, even if she was. But I'd say why I would is that uh, Elizabeth Churchill works at the intersection of uh, computing and human interaction, really. And her background and the work that she does, I just... Personally, I admire it hugely, uh, but also it's it's very evident that she understands that technology is technology and digital is essentially when it's used to solve problems, to create equal access uh, to opportunity. It is essentially human, and it's a human activity. And I think that's what we fundamentally uh, all need to understand about technology as well. So, yeah, if Elizabeth's out there and she's looking for her next uh, gig, her next gig, yeah, on her journey, uh, give me a shout. And she could pitch up at the Guinness Enterprise Centre. Yeah. 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 And Eamon, CEO of the Guinness Enterprise Centre, you will be the person who will be welcoming, him, <laughs> welcoming her. Who would you hire in a heartbeat? Well, uh, well, as I said, Marianne made a great pitch uh, for just earlier on. <laughs> I suppose, um, in He's my, a smooth yeah, talker, isn't he? My own business, Except when it comes to me. Don't even go there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, in my own business journey, I've been very fortunate to work with some excellent people. Um, 
But uh, you know, a bit of a Kerry lad moving up to Dublin, up up to, up from the to the you know from the sticks to the big smoke, as they'd say. Uh, looking at the likes of uh, Aidan Stacey, who's now the head of fundraising for the Irish Wheelchair Association, Caroline Spillane, who's now the Engineers Ireland, Ger Tannum from Island Bridge, Connor Horgan from Horgan PR. Are you going to stand my, for election or something? My, down there? <laughs> <laughs> you know, from my Irish rugby days, you know, Philip Brown, like what a what a learning curve. You know, I was so lucky to be able to learn directly from Philip and Martin Murphy from the, in the Aviva Stadium. Uh, learned an awful lot, I have to say, from the two of them. Mm-hmm. And now in, in this role, I'm, I'm so fortunate. Every single day I'm meeting entrepreneurs who are putting me in the privileged position of sharing their vision and asking me uh, and my team for help. Um, you know, Michael Culligan, Chief Executive Dublin Big Phenomenal as well, John Phelan in HBAN, etc. He is standing uh, for election. You know, <laughs> he's, no, covered, he's covered the, the, the yeah, entire so, state so of I'm, just, I'm just wondering what role I'm going to have to create for a person <laughs> but I'm know? waiting for the drum roll to find out who are you going to hire in a heartbeat so far you've hired two and a half t- rugby teams at this day <laughs> <laughs> no I, I would uh, I'd have to say I'd hire my dad okay yeah um, name your Liam dad Sa- Liam Sayers I'd, I'd hire him in a heartbeat um, brilliant with people uh, unlike me he's brilliant at putting things on paper um, I'm, I'm more of a doer I'm more of an act, action person whilst my dad would, would uh, be more of a person who, who'd you know just say listen let's, let's, let's take our time now let's put it down on paper let's talk it through let's think it through uh, not ad nauseum um, and then he, he's, he had a great knack of bringing people with him getting the right people on the bus and, and just taking and creating something really special uh, and a talker Oh, yes, unlike me, he's a great talker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, he, he there's is. something, you know that, Marianne, there's something in the blood down in Kerry. My dad was a Kerry man. Talk the hind legs off you, they would. Yeah, we have a Kerry man on the team as well. And yeah. only last week he said, as he just finished, I'd say about 20 minutes talking, he said he finished it with, I just love talking. <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we, just to finish, Connell, we, we, we run a program called Prosper. We, we started it in, in Kerry like, and... and it's a program we've run now. We've rolled out into two other counties. So I have a person, you know, I love where I come from. Um, and I think people from Cork will say the same about Cork, God bless them. And other parts of the country will say the same about their own country. But but as business people, you wonder how can you get back to where you're from? Mm. And you start thinking, well, do I, you know, I, the traditional way is I'll buy a ticket for a local draw. I'll get, buy a ticket for, you know, the, the school, the alma mater, etc. But that's not really giving back to what you've become, the person you've become. That's only giving back uh, cursory stuff. But the idea we created was this system where can we help early stage companies in Kerry grow and scale or fail quicker? Uh, so we we have this you know CXO uh, network called Prosper Kerry. People who want to give back to the county they're from, and they get to meet early stage companies in Kerry, and they'll help them with their business plan, their market strategy, or they'll say to them, "Listen, I've I've knowledge in that industry. You're going to find a tough, tough journey here." And it's gone extremely well. And, and what's because of that now, other areas of Kerry, from a business point of view, have been able to engage with each other. But we've got Cavan's up and running, Limerick's up and running. And it's been really fantastic. And for me, on a, on a selfish level, it's been great to re-engage and to have excuses to, you know, engage with great business people and Kerry, the likes of Jerry Kennelly and Edmund Harty and the McCarthys, etc. Um, so, yeah. But hire anybody from Kerry, but make sure you bring the business down there <laughs> after the after the GC, of course. I think he's. I think we'll give him our number one vote. What do you think? Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, Eamon, Eamon Sears uh, of the Guinness Enterprise Centre and Mary Ann uh, uh, Checkley, great name Checkley of Kenya. Thank you so much for joining us. Er on Podrela, and that is it from that great business show, episode sixty-one. Before we go. You know, we always keep in touch with Team GBS members who have joined us on the podcast previously. I was contacted by Michelle O'Keefe, saxophonist and sometimes head of wealth advisory at Good Body Stockbrokers, who tells me that there is still time to get involved with their fun fantasy portfolio competition run in association with the Gloss magazine. So far, I have over 300 fantasy portfolios set up and lots of trading going on. So great to see such activity. And for those not interested in the trading portfolio, you can still learn so much from all of the learning material they're posting for free on their website, goodbody.ie. Do check it out. And if I remember, Michelle was on three podcasts ago. That will make it number 58, I think. 
and so to our team. The prize for most enterprising sound engineer of the week goes to our Rob Curry and the gaffer Peter Rice will put in a late shift to, to make sure we remain the world's best sounding podcast. My thanks to all here at the Dublin Podcast Studios who are mad keen to make and record podcasts for your business. We at Team GBS work with them, so we produce world-class podcasts for clients like Love Irish Food. And we'd like to do the same for your business. After all, in marketing, podcasts are the new black. That Great Business Show is a commercial business, and we'd welcome your ads. Join wise advertisers like Big Red Cloud, Izmi, Uderos Nogertochta and others by supporting what our listeners call Ireland's Best Business Podcast. My thanks to Helen Morrow of Commit PR for lining up the Guinness Enterprise Centre item. And it's a double top for Elaine O'Regan at Bannerton PR, who delivered David Russell plus Lisa Haskins for us. And finally, my thanks to our sponsor, DeFactoShave.com, the world's best shaving oil. Try it for just one week, and like me, you will be a forever convert. So from me, Conal Moran, Gurev Mila Mahagavagishtachlin, until next time, Slan.